Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for coming along. Um, I've just been chatting to Susie and Bryony. I'm very excited um, talking about the night, the, the, the night and everything that's going to happen. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time out to come along and celebrate uh, the launch of this lovely, lovely book. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Um, and thank you to those who've, who've pre-ordered. I've seen uh, people posting about it, which is honestly one of the nicest things you can do. So thank you so much. Um, so tonight we're gonna have some readings by all three of us. Um, and Susie's gonna go first and I'm gonna introduce her in a minute. And then Bryony, and then apparently I'm the headliner. So I'm gonna go last. <laughs> um, and then after that, uh, if you want to stay for a bit of a Q&A, uh, we've got some questions for each other, but then also you can ask any questions that you want to as well. Um, but, you know, if you need to dash off, we totally understand. Um, so I guess we need to get started. Um, so I'm going to introduce the lovely Susie Campbell, uh, who has kindly come along as a guest reader tonight. Um, I've got a, a proper biography and everything, so I'm going to read this out. Um, so, so Susie uh, Campbell is a poet and research student at off, oh yeah, I can't speak, uh, Oxford Brookes University, where she is studying Gertrude Stein, prose poetry and experimental grammar. That is a great term, by the way, I like that, experimental grammar. Um, her poetry and her academic writing have appeared in many UK and international journals, and her most recent publications are I Return to You by Samson Lowe, Tenta by Guillemot Press and Enclosures by Osmosis Press, which is run by the lovely Bryony Hughes, is also here. And she has The Sleeping Place, which is forthcoming with Guillemot Press as well. Uh, I've seen a bit of that, it looks great. And I think you're gonna hear a little bit of that tonight. Her visual poetry is included in Seen as Red, Kingston University Press, The Book of Pentaract, Pentaract Press. Oh, I love that book, that's great. Mm -hmm. And forthcoming in Seeing in Tongues, Still Incisors Press. Her sound poetry includes Echolocation, a collaboration with Chris Kerr, released by Angry Starlings Imprint. And that's uh, run by Hem Press, who are also the lovely publishers of my book. So, whoop whoop. Uh, <laughs> Susie, I'm going to hand over to you to let you read. Oh, well, thank you so much, Nikki. And uh, thank you for inviting me to be part of this celebration of your launch tonight. And thank you to everybody turning up on a Monday evening. It's lovely to see you all. Um, yes, as you said, I'm going to just uh, share a little bit um, from my forthcoming project from Guillemot Press. Um, that's not being launched until April, um, so this is just going to be a little bit of a pre-launch sharing. Um, and I'm just going to say a little bit about the project and then just read an extract um, from it, um, just to kind of give you a little bit of a taste, really. So um, this, The Sleeping Place is a project that came out of my discovery that there was a Saxon burial ground um, on the site where my family home in Surrey was built. It was excavated back in the 1920s and then built over. So I became interested in how I might stage these archaeological excavations in the text. But the driver for that was the discovery of literally of a skeleton in my closet, that the bones of what I would see as a violent nationalist myth of, of a white Anglo-Saxon past was there buried in my own backyard. And so I felt compelled to engage with that. To, it felt like a responsibility to, to address that. Um, part of the, the, the responsibility that comes with living in the southeast of England and, and all that that entails. Um, so that's what this project's about. Um, as I got further, I, it, it, the starting point for it was very much using um, constraint and the experimental grammar that Nikki referred to that I was um, I've developed from my interest in Gertrude Stein. But as time went on, um, themes to do with death and mortality and ethical considerations to do with working with human remains began to surface, probably because I was hanging around in cemeteries rather a lot, um, and so I wanted to find other ways to engage with that and. So mathematics and ritual um, and um, other things to do with the discovery of Lewis Carroll's grave being in the same area contributed to the composition of the text. Um, and I won't say any more about that now, but that might be something that I revisit in the Q&A that we're going to have at the end. But I think I now need to share some of the text with you so that uh, it, you've got some context for what I've just been saying. And I'm just going to quickly share my screen. Thank you, Nikki, for allowing us to do that. Um, because the visual aspect of the text is uh, pretty important to me.
Can I just check if people can see that okay? You want to give me a thumbs up? Yep, yes. Yeah. I can see Vicky giving me a thumbs up. Thank you, Vicky. <laughs> um, okay, so the sleeping place. 1929. A gardener discovers a Saxon burial ground next to the Victorian cemetery where Lewis Carroll is buried. And then I just quickly wanted to share with you um, the cover that is the artwork that the wonderful Rose Ferriby, who is an artist and archaeologist, has made for the project. Um, and also um, the book is filled with her work. It's an intrinsic part of the book as a whole. Um, so I wanted to share a little bit more. That's just a little glimpse from inside. Um, and I am going to be talking about poetic ritual at the end if, if it comes up in questions. And I'm just sharing their little image that I might talk about at the end um, if we if that comes up in our discussion. But I'm actually going to share a bit, an extract of the text from towards the end um, of the piece. Burials 96 to 127. And the Reverend Charles Ludwig Dodgson Lewis Carroll fell asleep January 14th, 1898. A livelier darkness where names and curses and newborns collide. Find the spot marked on the map where grave robbers name ash trees for a ship or leave behind just the hands in a circle. He allocates numbers in pencil, which is one of the things in his dream, says Alice. Anglo-Saxon attitudes only get more phony, but never laugh at a ritual of white rabbits. Already there is sliding beneath surveillance by faking sequence, some of the squares are empty, and a second set of measurements, 423 and 5716. A gardener thinks a sheep skull stove in side to side is no murder, until he brings up the narrow thigh bone. Bound hair is bright as dry firewood. A headwoman and her daughter name their shields for a female horse, and scoop wet clay from the riverbed. And a black bead, a red bead, a yellow bead, a mottled bead, a black bead, a blue bead, a silver bead. For an old god walks in a field of geese and is the walk of one born in the full open field. No one is more fleet-footed than a curse, and how a free moon is quieter here than water. The turn of your spindle summons a sharp beak or the wind, and nothing is faster than a strong male horse or a sword. Burials 140 to 85. And Godfrey C. Wheat laid to rest in hope of the glorious resurrection, January 28th, 1899. Dogs with wide eyes run through a field of grass. Mystery is heavy and a long silence. Creep through the iron gates to catch them at their junkets. Who are they? asks Alice. Within this area falls asleep as quietly like and chalks the map. But unquietly the wooden box is rocked. Unquietly the yew until the box is burst. Where am I? asks Alice. We've all changed a lot. On judgment day, Ugamant for what to owe. Rigomont if water a regiment of white. Creep through the iron gates to catch them, uneasily the car stands and tennis nets. Something disturbs the rose bushes, white powder on the courts, and emerald chips are marble. There is a strong case the massacre is little more than a myth, and even if not, there is no relevance to this cemetery. But who does not care for jam tarts and gimbals? If you sit quietly, you can hear them move as size yields to the giant tree and shrinks the cross. He's lucky to get this gardening work, so he keeps digging in his brownish hat. And a yellow bead, a mottled bead, an amber bead, a silver bead, a green bead, a green bead, a black bead. Apples ripen sweeter than a male horse, and a yew tree is grieving where there is weaving. How far past the ghost is a face, and the full moon is quieter in a land of geese. Naming apple trees as bright as dry firewood here at night, and no one is more fleet-footed than the soft-stepping doe and unbound hare. 
burials 159 to 89, and in memory of Annie Pierce entered into rest August the 3rd, 1902. Broken silence and a shunting beneath a beech hedge and the boundary fence makes grace for another, thinner and hungrier and spreading. The turn of a spindle summons an unkind ghost as bees summon the plum. Two, four, three and one, seven, five, six. A song about hazelnuts and a basket and picking nuts bigger than the first hazelnuts and a song about the blue-skinned boar and an overturned basket with no hazelnuts. A moving blue and a green lost. How an individual from a duplicated finger bone is more dangerous than eating unknown berries. Here is tracing the map in red crayon and a brownish hat. And a silver bead, a blue bead, a red bead, a silver bead, a red bead, a blue bead, a yellow bead. Of one not born here, or wind across the dream, or fleet-footed in the land, no one is more. The full moon is prouder than the water at night, and beyond flight is an open field. Quieter here is the dog with no eyes. Tomorrow is following how a free woman finds the head of the river, but nothing is sharper than grief. Burial 79 to 81, and at rest, Charlotte, beloved wife, died April 22nd, 1917. A long silence, as if chalk has no skeletons. Drawing on a pure white sheet, head pillowed for the long. Never laugh when they crowd onto the what square the whitty square us, the white squares. Nothing is sharper than a strong beak or the wind across an open field. Tomorrow is the dog chasing its own fears. The signs of a sacred place are a red horse and this brownish leaf, but a horse across the field is a returning needle. A sister waits in a field of barley where a language is opening. Where there is waiting, a language opens, and they are ready at last, an opening in the crow flight and the long silence. And a mottled bead, a black bead, a blue bead, a silver bead, a yellow bead, a white bead, an amber bead. For the walk beyond a yew tree is quieter than water at night. No one is harvest and nothing is sword. What is torn by grieving and adopting a new name and not one name is lost. But where a free woman walks, there is weaving in a land of naming. How far past the full moon is a sea crossing, or is it a ghost? Burials 15 to 65, and Emma Withers fell asleep here September 18th, 1935, 6, 7, 1, 5, and 3, 2, 4. Requiescat sits up, its blind face, an Arthur, and Uther and Inutha and another make a hero from this crowd. What hybrid headed life or death when the jaws are gagged with earth? How to speak when stones are trapped in the throat? A telephone call from the hospital and unable to. A notebook and a pencil and a mask make a body into a map. Several heads share a di ditch with gifts of Godwin's murders. Bead maker tries to speak, but the mouth tool grinds slow and teeth break. How do stones speak when broken or trapped in a throat? They move and move and move and move. Further than throwing is a river, and beyond is shallow water where a stone is a step and a quarrel at rest. Before the stone is useful, it is a stone. And still, it moves, just yesterday, restringing the long journey between the bones of 223 and these seven stones. 
and a broken bead, a broken bead, a red bead, a broken bead, a red bead, a broken bead, a missing bead. A silence and silence. Nothing is sharper than an open field and silence. Tomorrow is following the silence and a long silence. And I'll stop there. Well done, Susie. That was fantastic. And lots of lovely comments in the chat for you as well. Thank you. We'll definitely check those out. <laughs> well, thank you've you. Got, you've got some fans. Oh, well, I, I, I will. Um, but before I do that, I've got uh, another responsibility, and that is to introduce the lovely Bryony, um, who's going to be reading next. Um, and again, I'm going to use a, a proper bio as Nikki said or I'm not sure how proper our bios are but they're, they're, they're some lovely things here. So Bryony Hughes is a poet, a visiting tutor and Techni AHRC funded PhD candidate based at Royal Holloway. Um, she's researching hydropoetics Kathleen Fraser and Charles Olson. Bryony also teaches on the creative writing MA program at Brunel University and beyond form creative writing. Her publications include the wonderful Dorothy, who I'm saying wonderful, she didn't put that in her bio, um, from Broken Sleep Books, um, Microsporidial from Samson Lowe, and Rhizome or Taproot from Paperview Books. Her limited edition artist books have been collected by the National Poetry Library, the Senate House Library, the Bodleian, and King's College London Special Collections. She is, of course, editor at Osmosis Press, and she's a co-founder of the Crested Tick Collective, which is how I first met Bryony. She's an associate member of the Royal Holloway Poetics Research Centre and a participant in the Tech Embodied Practice Group. She co-edits the However How to Digital Archive project at SUNY Buffalo. And I'm really looking forward to hearing you read next, Bryony. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for that introduction, Susie. And my goodness, I'm quite intimidated to follow after that reading. That was absolutely gorgeous. And I can't wait to get my hands on your book from Guillemot. Um, just before I start reading, I want to say a big thank you to Nikki for inviting me to read to support the launch of Exorcism, Exorcism Becomes Habit. What a gorgeous book. Um, I, If you have not ordered yet, uh, I highly recommend it. Now is the time. This is the sign. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from my book that is forthcoming this Friday from Broken Sleep's Rhizomes. Um, and then I'm also going to read from an artist book that I've been working on recently, um, just because I feel like mixing it up a little bit. Um, just to give a quick introduction to Rhizomes. Um, I've now got copies of it, so here it is. Um, the book was written... I don't want to call it a lockdown book, but it was written during the COVID lockdown um, where naturally we were not able to go stray too far from um, our immediate kind of domestic surroundings. Um, I'm very lucky in the respect that my, my little flat backs onto a very kind of curated horrendous golf course which during the lockdown i was very lucky to be able to trespass all over um much to the the horror <laughs> of the people who own the golf course um and this was something that i did as a kind of daily ritual as a way of kind of interacting with something that wasn't just me <laughs> and that came to an abrupt end after the local common, Chobham Common, um, caught fire. There was a wildfire just because of the extreme heat. Um, and it got to the point where kind of the smoke was blowing in the direction of our house. Um, we had to pack an ev evacuation kit. It was all quite intense, but nothing terrible happened to us. The landscape, however, was absolutely decimated. Um, so that's kind of the context of the first portion of this book. Um, and I'm also going to be showing a couple of um, sketches, I suppose, um, made with um, charcoal um, that somewhat demonstrate the way in which I was engaging with the landscape. I was looking at different embodied ways to um, interact with my surroundings. And though I would not claim to be an artist, I decided to do some art. Um, anyway, 
there's enough of that. I will I will begin reading. This section's called Murmur or Back to Nature. Everything was fucked and the silence and the loss or the day to day had got to me or all of us. They claimed we were getting back to nature or some of us noticed more plant varieties, but many ignored it all and stared at an island on a screen. There was a buzz and it wasn't the planes or the bees because they were declining, we couldn't stop that. It was a buzz or murmur of sign of life where there was none. 7th of the 8th, 2020. Everything was plant varieties, claim, murmur, screen, buzz. When the ash fell, I packed an escape kit, head to the he hand to the head, the gesture of a gun. The ground was black and the trees were black and the road was blocked so we drove out and got out and watched the orange plume and waited for the spit of rain. 8th of the 8th, 2020. Retrospective plume. Scale as spit or common. It was all fucked but her whiskers quivered. And I know there was a hole in the side of her head, but she knew there was something turning and the rhododendron were blooming and we didn't know if things made sense or they didn't. 10th of the 8th, 2020. Quivered, sense, and turning, and turning, and turning, and turning, and turning. During these days, these weeks, the trespassing wasn't bad. Some of us knew this was a possibility and took full advantage. Heather, heat, peat, ice, tiptoe, do your thing and don't look back. Some call this tranquility or chaos of a hoof or hooves. Nothing was maintained, so we decided not to think beyond these three miles. 13th of the 4th, 2020. Maintain a revision there times over trespass of advantage look back we noticed that the trees had been chopped and it felt like a straightforward metaphor they said it would stop the flames from jumping so we agreed on a new distance between trees and trenches near the road and the but how many times have you heard this story first of the ninth 2020 oh no Metaphor between trees and trenches. It was all connected. There was summer, then winter, and the geese left and returned like nothing was fucked, and we questioned if we were wrong about it all. The 3rd of the 11th, 2020. Question as connection. The road, the hoof, the rhododendron, the ash, the murmur. Some of us closed our eyes to pray, to see, to think, to know that we weren't interacting with the language of it, but the truth and spill and, let's be honest, our motivation swayed with the wind. 5th of the 4th, 2020. Two, 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 two. There wasn't a revolution or uprising and attempts at this were banned and we understood the why nots and the whys and resentment grew from one to the other and we backed away from the problem at hand. 20th of the 5th, 2020. To hand resentment from one to the other, watch as the wing spans. We knew that planning was needed, so I grew tomatoes, blushing from green to red, hoping this would mean something, and it did for a while, 11th of the 8th, 2020. While as fleeting, red, abstract, this moment was comfortable. Some of us wrote about how it was all fucked and tried to stamp the echo of a scream onto the page, but the mimicry or attempt could not resonate beyond our fingers. 12th of the 8th. 2020. Thank you. So I'm now going to read from um, C Grammar, um, which is an artist book. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing because it is quite long, um, but I'm just going to pick a few different um, poems at random. Currently, this is an edition of five. There might be six if I can be bothered to, to find another one. Um, we will find out. 
Um, just to give a bit of context behind this piece, I'm really interested in the word or, as in O-R, not O-A-R, although there is a pun, I guess, lurking around. I'm interested in how it allows um, the, the poetic line or the sentence even to kind of shift back and forwards, how it's constantly wavering. I kind of think about this word as an almost, I suppose, a sea term. Foul water. Alternatives could or should be basin or lagoon or pool or puddle or small body or was there a motive or I got here by myself, iterating through conversions or turning towards any other synonym of conversion is sea change or changing simply. The goals are always here or sounding in this landlocked space, they scream and I hear home or familiar or distance. There is no process, just one inappropriate thing or the other, resulting in draining and re-landscaping or adding or removing scenic rocks. They did this in Niagara, a 1969 dam or dewatering, 12,000 years of flow suspended or in freefall or uncovering, two bodies, dead. But this wasn't the point, instead look towards conservation or mastery over nature or American fantasy or general maintenance, but what can be more sublime? I've never been there, but Personally, I'm watching NiagaraFallsLive.com or nothing at all because it's 5.14 EST and dark or the camera is off or both converging or after sales. Or it might not be a well. Language writ on the surface or filmic, we enter a repeated motion, pluck a brick or pebble or grip from the wall and watch as it plunges upwards. The sky is reflected or refracted, not just language, but this moment, these weeks, pacing is the word, or churning, not intense, in fact, the water is quite shallow. There is no signal here or explanation, later Google reveals this space as a major artwork or commissioned by the National Trust or Clause 39 of the Magna Carta, but all I can think about is floating in a lilo in the centre where the pebble dropped. Or... Swifting. Consider these cavities of Portland stone or beams as reinforced to open your mouth and let out a sigh or silence punctuated or printed two years ago. Matt, I hold them. Waiting for a redaction or reduction of the surface or instead bend towards the current, they say let sleeping dogs lie, but the turning or renegotiating or the conceptual is a fine line to walk or I can swim further without hesitation of breath or the edges may move or supplement the direction of this meander, a step never taken, the prints or negatives have remained present. The subject or foreground blurs, but look to our bodies or markings or notes on craft or shape of the hand in relation to its environment, remember or ruminate on the possibilities of the self. Plunging, not bathing or skinny dipping, any other leisure activity, instead you feel or measure or exaggerate the depth of your toe or drift with your hair and yes, do get carried away or cut a feather. This cable ties or drains, grouping, the foreshore for unsuitable or laddered access, to walk the plank or crawl the plank, thinking marks the spot or suitable receptacle where those runner beans grow. Advice, don't drop the body or your head into or onto the mud or shingle those blitz bricks slip or shatter until your scout survival asks, are you recycling right? Is your post box strapped to a nearby tree? Watch as rent shudders into the thousands, or thank you. <laughs> I think I will end there. My computer just started doing some very strange things, so I'm, I'm very glad that I'm still here. I now have the absolute pleasure of introducing Nikki, and I'm going to read Nikki's bio from the back of the book just to make sure that I'm waving it around in the air as much as I possibly can. Um, before everybody came onto the call, I was suggesting that I might use it as a bit of a fan because it's quite, for some reason, it's it's warm in my house for the first time in months. <laughs> Nikki is managing editor of Street Cake magazine and also runs the Street Cake Writing Prize. Her pamphlet, I Better Let You Go, and collection, Fanny Be Mine, are out of Bia Boer Press. She is the winner of the Virginia Prize 2020 and her second novel, Volta, was published in May 2021. She likes to play with words, but this is her first time using so many forward slashes. 
please give a massive round of applause, hugs, um, and everything else to Nikki. <laughs> Thank you, Bryony. That was lovely. <laughs> and I really enjoyed your reading. I love the way it's so physical. It was great. Um, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm uh, currently dog-earing my copy of Exorcism Becomes Habit. It's quite fun. Um, I'm sure it's making some people cringe, but um, I quite like doing that with my books. Um, I hope you've been enjoying the poetry so far. I think it's been amazing. Um, and I really hope I can live up to those great performances, which we've already seen. Uh, <laughs> um, the poems in this are, are quite short. And as we've said, there are a lot of forward slashes. I am going to share my screen so you'll be able to see the beauty of all of the forward slashes which are included. Um, you may be asking why? Why so many forward slashes? Um, and it's a question I ask myself quite a lot. Um, <laughs> but um, it just uh, kind of felt kind of, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and spotlight myself, which is quite scary, but um, I, I might do that so you can see properly. Um, so yeah, when I when I was putting this together and, and kind of writing some of these things, um, the slashes were kind of a great way to kind of move between things for me, I think. Um, and when I read it, it may sound like a, a lot of nonsense, but if you spend a bit of time with it, I'm sure you'll um, you'll see the threads running through it. Um, there's a lot sort of going on. Um, it's kind of a bit like how your mind works, how you're thinking about something and then you skip to something else and then you go back and um, that's kind of how I like to see it. So I shall stop delaying and read you some poems. <laughs> um, I'm going to share my screen so you can actually see it, although it's my PDF of the proof. So you're going to see two poems on the page, but I'll, I'll um, just tell you which one I'm going to read. Can everyone see that okay? Brilliant, thanks Susie, that was helpful. <laughs> um, that's in the way, so that's not good. Okay, so I'm gonna read Acceptance. This is it. Can't you see I'm trying? The world laughs when it turns. Clouds are just incognito. Distractions are aplenty in the sea. Don't drop to the bottom of the sky. Look up, look down. Words are not a life ring in the middle of everything, but I made sense of the world through a spine. Between the bars, I learned to love myself after a sentence. I'm learning to love you, to let the rope break, to take the threads and the splits, the coil as a trap, an escape. Everything has more than one side. When you look out of the window, what did you see? The past was streaked across my eyes. Where are you heading? No one is waiting for us. The map is blurry and my eyes scatter. I hear a ringing in the dark. It rings and rings. Don't answer. So that's acceptance. Um, I'm gonna read you another one now. In fact, I'm gonna read you kind of a two part one. Um, so I need to skip up to a couple of pages. Um, so we have this one here um, called disease. Are you, the pro are, are you progression of disease? No matter how much they screw up, you are not the only one living in the dark. Detachment with love. Of course, if you answered yes to any of these consequences, there are many opinions and viewpoints on this. Here is a simple description. You have actually made it easier for them to get worse. Most of their problems are being solved. It is love. Accepted part of the blame, avoided talking out of fear, drinking in hopes it will strengthen relationship, fail to deny. They want to be without utilities. That is not the only shelter. Is jail inherited? I'm going to read the, the one which is linked to this, which it, when I wrote it was kind of a bit of a um, kind of a, an interpretation, an opposite interpretation. So it's called Take Two. The limit to good. It means everyone will be dying in the light. 
the possibilities for friends, warmth and bitter gardens. You avoid attachment with hate. There are a few facts and answers on this. I haven't made it harder for them to get better. Only when she has offered to hide, denied the innocence, face silence, hope of shelter, eating knowing the bonds are broken. There are many exposures. Is freedom learned? So yeah, it's kind of a weird interpretation, but I quite liked it, especially um, warmth and bitter gardens, which is quite fun. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm going to keep going. It's kind of strange with no sound, isn't it? Um, I don't know if Susie and Bryony felt this is kind of strange. <laughs> you're just reading to yourself. But I know you're all there, so that's comforting. <laughs> all right. Um, I'm going to read one called Close This. I'm going to put it up on the screen again so you can see it just in case anyone has any problems with hearing me properly. Um, here we go. We'll close this. So I'm leaving the WhatsApp group. Words are loaded and redundant. The wasp died long ago. The height of everything is so high. I threw you in a black hole. You were sleeping off your demons. And I left home with the door open. The wood splintered across time. What did she say to you that night? A circle is a loop. The rain slides under covers. Why don't you stay a while? I'm not ready for this to end. Is fascination obsession? Is obsession a page full of words? I'll do graffiti if you teach me how to spell. Everything you think you know. The gun was in the first line. Okay, I did want to read another one. I should really do some kind of order to stop me skipping around the book. Um, I don't know if anyone else does this, but I do. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, this was one, um, it actually, I'm going to read the first one in the book, which was probably the first one I sort of decided was going to be part of this, I suppose. So it's called Inspiration. You love with your hands. I feel I in my pencil, lead, tutting, editing, conscious is constraint, is conscious. Constraint is conscious. Poet is a compulsive liar, no drive, autonomy, plot driven. When you ask where I've been, interpretation is a chamber field, care enough to argue, never went to church, want random parts of life in collections, permitted to be inspired. Where am I? You love you, love conscious chamber, standing on my own again. So yeah, that was a great one to um, to start this off as as uh, as it says on the back. It's a banishing of no negative emotions, and it's about not allowing someone to hold you back from kind of saying what you want to say. Um, so that that poem was quite good for that, and kind of making me think about that. So um, that's why that one's at the start, really. Um, okay, I'm gonna read another one for you. Um, I think I might read this one. Did I? Okay. Okay, I quite, I'm going to read this one because I quite like the last line. <laughs> I like the rest of it too, but I like the last line. <laughs> um, and then I might read the one that I had in there, uh, Osmosis published, so. <laughs> okay, Gaslight Me Forever. You're too sensitive. The house sinks. A cloud releasing a landslide. Cows swallow scows. Stop thinking. Fasten the bodies of Velcro. Stand here, stand there. Carry letters in your arms to tell you. People lose their memories in their words. I'll carry them home. You are drunk on denial, turning everything to sludge. Skin hardens underneath the clay. The bark of a tree hardens. Age me like a tree. Maybe you're too sensitive. A small flash of something. Infections turn me around. The body is tough in love. The cold lips. Unspent potential. What is left in the bottom? The rain felt stupid. And that's what happened instead. All right, I'm going to read the one that uh, 
it was actually on the osmosis site so a nod to Bryony <laughs> um thank you Bryony it was good to see that it wasn't a totally load of uh, rubbish I was writing thank you <laughs> uh, I just need to find it okay it's called mortality <laughs> The cat lives for perhaps 15 years, but don't tell him that. Nothing is worse than the sell by date. We skip towards the revolting tide. I work my mouth on your lifestyle. Do not wake in the middle of the climax. Time is alone and time is what? The sign at the station informs me of closure I didn't know I needed. We are arrows pointed at the sun, blinding and curdling. Fish are walking and we are gliding through the soil. The tide pushes, drives over our brains and lemons are only sour in comparison. <laughs> um, I was gonna do something a bit different today as well and read one from, from something which isn't published just for a bit of a shake up. Um, I've just got to move all this stuff, which is here. Um, and then I might need one more to finish. That's okay if I'm not boring you too, too much at the moment, hopefully not. <laughs> Um, so I was going to read you one from, um, I've, I've started writing a little collection about fears. Um, so I was going to read you one from that. And uh, the working title for the collection is uh, Beware of Moving Emotions. Um, but yeah, it doesn't have a home yet, but it's still, I'm enjoying writing it. And this uh, poem is called When You Die. Um, so I'm going to read this for you. As you can see just on a Word document. I do have a little sound thing going on too, but I don't know how that will work, so we'll see. Okay, so I'll press play. Search. When you die. Why do people die? Will you remember me when you die? I don't have time to Google explaining it's atheism to a child. I backspace. You stare okay, right at me ever. and I say, I'm sorry, when you die, you're and you keep looking at me, waiting for a different answer. And I think, what is a soul? This is the worst torture. Growing this person, helping them to live, only for them to live. What if I miss you? Without. I want to reach across. Who will look after me? But I leave a gap. The gap I won't be able to fill. Will I die one day? Maybe if I leave it like this. You'll learn to build Where will you be? in this space. The worst part, you make me want to believe in heaven or some place where I could pretend I won't really be gone and you won't be alone and you won't wonder if I remember you because of course I want to. But this is the one thing I cannot do for you. But let's play pretend. Thank you. I'm going to go back to exorcism now. Thanks for indulging me in that one. I just felt like I wanted to read one from that as well. Um, I'm going to read one more, if I can find it. <laughs> yeah, it's close to this one, so I should be able to find it. Okay. Actually, I might finish on my end one from this. I've changed my mind. So this is always a fun one to finish on. It's just called Experiments. So apologies for the swear words that have been coming out tonight, but a good swear word, I think, is, is always welcome if used appropriately. <laughs> Original works are shit. Crack me a joke before I break. Don't ever stop observing. Be an experiment. Your reactions are so bonded. When words stop, my heart is still. The panda says no. A turn of phrase turns me out. I'm the wrong way round. The world crumbles without enough saturation. Bring me a simile if it helps. Add this column to that one. I don't know what this makes. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs> I will stop screen sharing now. Thank you for listening to my strange forward slash creations. <laughs> um, uh, and thank you everyone for listening to everyone as well and all your lovely comments it means a lot for you to write nice things about what we're reading out um 
And we do have some a little Q&A section now, so uh, no problems if you have to shoot off, that's fine. Um, but if you'd like to hear a bit more about the works that we read out, then please do stay and we'll have a little chat. We'll try not to wobble on for too long. Uh, <laughs> but um, And you can feel free to pop your questions in the chat as well. Um, so anything that you would like to know about any of it or writing processes or anything like that, just go for it. Um, Susie, Brian, do you want to unmute? Hello. <laughs> Hello, I'm unmuted. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> I was feeling a bit a bit alone there, so it's good, it's good. <laughs> I nearly unmuted. When you said that when you were reading, I nearly unmuted just to say hurrah, but then I thought that might put you off your reading, so I didn't. <laughs> Um, well, okay, so uh, we've got some questions, haven't we? We did think of some beforehand. Um, shall I shall I ask you one of my questions? Please, yeah. Okay, I, I might start with you, Susie. Um, so I really liked in your in your um, your collection the the use of kind of numbers and gravestone etchings, um, and it sort of really connected with the theme, obviously. Um, why did you kind of include those? Did you did you do that because that made you feel closer to it as well? Oh, um, great question. And a, co a couple of reasons um, which kind of go in slightly different directions. So, so the first reason was that I made the decision quite early on that I wanted to respond to the archaeological um, site plan um, and, and find a way of staging that in, in the text. And so um, I adopted the, so the, the um, site plan, the 1920s excavation site plan, um, numbered the burials in order that they were found. So it was quite random. Not, you know, they might have been 500 years apart, but they got the next number if they'd simply been found second. So I adopted that as a constraint. So essentially I created, there were 223 burials. So I created 223 pieces of text and then I read the site plan as though it were a book. And then I organized those pieces of text in that order. And so the numbers at the head of each page um, are an indication of the numbering of those pieces of text. That having said that, so basically that that's a gesture to the constraint um, that is a very direct response to the archaeological site plan. Having said that, um, I then felt that that very numbering of burials, um, it started to raise questions to me about the whole ethical um, considerations around working with human remains and um, the difference uh, if you refer to um, burials by number um, to if you refer to them by the, a name. And there's quite a lot in the piece about naming and not naming um, and the unnamed. Um, and so the you may have noticed that other numbers started to enter the text and I started to work with a more a sense of numerical symbolism and particularly the number seven mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I refer to my use of poetic ritual. I collected a little bit of ritual grave robbery and I collected seven pieces of chalk from a grave um, on this site and I sort of made them a little virtue with virtual individual that could then enter the text to host some of these concerns. And so what I hope you then see in the text, there's a, a tension between the numbering at the top of the page, which is both the kind of random numbering that the archaeologists gave the burials and the ran random ordering of my text set against something more symbolic um, and the sort of sense of um, what happens when you start to engage with the idea that these are human remains, however old, I mean, hundreds of years old, but nevertheless, they are human remains. Um, and then the final reason why those numbers were so important was um, Lewis Carroll, Charles Dodgson, um, whose grave happens to be in the same hillside, was, of course, a mathematician. And um, he was very interested in the relationship between mathematics as a symbolic system and language as a symbolic system. And so I drew on some of that numerical symbolism for my text as well. So, um, so thank you for picking up on that. The numbers are actually really important. Um, when I read, read the text aloud, I quite often don't read the numbers, but tonight, um, because I was sharing the screen and you could see them, I really did want to read at least some of those numbers. So thank you so much for picking that up in a question. That was great. Um, and yeah, you can definitely see it when you're reading through. So yeah. I think it's good. It's quite a nice sort of 
marker, isn't it? It's good. And I love the numbers, the shape of the numbers, I think, start to, um, to, to work in a different way as well. So no, thanks so much for that question. Well, Rich has got one which kind of links in, I think. Did you want to say it out loud, Richard, or do you just want me to read that? Sorry. Well, it's kind of a rambling thought, so it's, it's kind of easier to say out loud if that's OK. But I was really fascinated by this idea of um, the ethics of handling human remains. And when Susie said that at the beginning of her reading, the, the first place my mind went to was um, some Italian Catholic practices where they actually take skulls and adopt them in the hope that they can um, pray for them through purgatory. So the idea being that they can hopefully raise up their souls in the afterlife. And it, I think there's a similar practice in the East of um, taking um, human remains, they don't sort of hang around as ghosts and then move on to their to reincarnation. And it kind of struck me that you're kind of, you're kind of all doing that with your books, I think, because what, what Susie was doing was, um, and doing that for her, you know, for the land of her family, and I think Brani was doing that for the like her her landscape, and I think he was doing that as well. Nikki was um, almost trying to maybe redeem is too strong a word, but to um, do something with all of these emotions, you know. Um, and so I, I think where that where that made me land was like the maybe just talking around like language and grief and like what like what's going on there with, with with writing and grief and language and grief and how to uh, think through grief oh it's really interesting yeah that's great and what a good link between all three yeah, <laughs> we didn't, we didn't even play richard did we <laughs> no i, I really oh, i really again. I think that you've picked up on something really important and I agree I think having gone first I could then really hear some of the things that I mentioned actually came up in very different ways than the other two readings so I think that was you know really um, an important thread that linked the three. Awesome so, sorry I'm aware that Sarah Sarah you've got your hand up so do you have a question? Hello yes I do thank you um, and thanks all for the amazing readings I just really enjoyed that um, so it's a question to Susan it's related to what you were saying about the numbers I thought that was really fascinating about that and thinking about how to how you talk about and treat human remains and the respect you need to apply for that I wondered if that also fed into the choices you made about how you laid out your the text on the page because um, I noticed that a lot of your lines have a real musicality to them um, but you stuck very much to the, the kind of, sort of prose poem format. And, and is that linked to that, that point about thinking about how you reflect the difficulty of using such material and such stimulus? Yeah, I mean, yes, um, I, I think that, that the, the way that it appears on the page is very much an attempt to find ways to to make language speak beyond language if you know what I mean so, so the material bringing the materiality of language to play um, to make meanings beyond the semantic um, as a way of gesturing towards some of that difficulty the difficulty of how you do respond to human remains that's so many hundred of years old it's really hard to hold on to that sense of humanity but also um, the kind of the the much more personal sense of grief um, and awareness of death that happens when you spend a lot of time thinking about bones and skeletons and, and, and bringing in the cemetery. And I really wanted to find ways of almost formalizing the language on the page, um, particularly through use of um, the sonic patterning, which you've picked up on, the visual patterning, um, and almost a, a slight for formalizing of the way that the prose poem then sat on the page with its spaces. Um, and I used a lot of doodling when I first started to try and get that feel right. So the, each page is almost like a burial site. Um, and so particular shapes and numbers start to then emerge from the site of each of those pages. Um, and I would say that one of the things I found, uh, and I know Vicky put in the, the, the chat a question about my use of experimental grammar. One of the things that I did was to um, almost evacuate a center of consciousness as governing the grammar um, of, of the sentences of the prose poetry. And then that, that absence, 
that then happens, the kind of a gap in the grammar began to speak of grief and death. Mm -hmm. So I try to allow that to almost hollow out what you then see on the page. Um, so um, uh, your, your question is, is so wonderful and rich, the, the way you've responded to the work. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Brian, there is a question for you. Jules asks, are you still trespassing and drawing as part of your practice? Oh, thank you for that question. Good, good question. Um, yes, yes, but not to such an extent um, in terms of the trespassing, just because now when I walk across the golf course, there are flying golf balls um and i don't really want to die that doesn't stop me um but um <laughs> it's definitely less of a kind of <laughs> meditative um kind of process but in terms of the drawing i i it's is i i am drawing as part of my kind of interaction with natural landscapes but i think i'm also kind of experimenting with different types of art art making and mark making um be that kind of spillages of ink be that um kind of paint and charcoal but also photo taking um just getting my hands dirty in the soil um standing in the rain um <laughs> yeah just i think what interests me more than the art making itself so with you know these these sketches it, it isn't what is being produced but it's more the repeated act of going out and doing the same thing again and again so with these these are sketches of um different root systems um and stems um kind of around my my home um and the act of drawing those out again and again um became a bit of a, a ritual or a habit <laughs> um and actually with the word habit nikki can i jump in here and ask you a question <laughs> that was a good segue wasn't it it was very habit. good tell me about the habit of writing tell me about how was this text made <laughs> big question brownie <laughs> Um, thank you for answering that question as well, though. Um, I like the way you incorporate drawing into your into your pieces. It's really cool. I'm terrible at drawing, but um, yeah, I should try it one time. <laughs> um, oh, I don't know. Habit. Um, I think um, once I decided how I wanted it to look, into like I had some stuff that I was sort of working with, and then. Um, once I started getting happy with the slashes, it just seemed to work for me. <laughs> um, because, uh, as I said, it kind of worked with how I was feeling at that point. Kind of, um, I think, you know, some of it did happen in, in lockdown as well. Um, so a bit fragmented, a bit kind of, your brain does feel a bit all over the place in there um, at points. And uh, it was kind of, I'm ready to get this stuff on the page um but I kind of wanted to yeah kind of show how the mind works you know you're thinking about that but then yeah then you skip to that then you come back to this and um yeah it it was yeah it was interesting um sometimes I, I, I think there were a couple of poems that I decided weren't good enough to put in there um but the ones that are in there I think I'm happy with kind of what they're talking about. We did have a discussion actually, me and Richard, about whether the title should be included or not. So um, that was interesting as well. But he didn't think they were necessary, but I felt they were necessary. So we had a good chat about that. Um, and it's really nice that he's open to chatting about those things as well. Um, so yeah, it felt like there were kind of subjects and things to cover. Um, even though sometimes if you read them, they do look kind of random. <laughs> that was a long answer. Sorry. Can I, can I pile in and ask you a question as well? Um, Nikki, while we're <laughs> talking, as it's your launch, um, exorcism, um, such a fascinating um, concept for the title. And I suppose I just wanted to ask a bit more about how far you think that poetry is an exorcism for, for the poet, for the writer, or how much it's you were hoping it's an exorcism for the reader or is it a play between those two? I definitely think writing is 
exorcism, to be honest. Um, I'm sure uh, some people wouldn't feel that way. Um, but the things that I write about probably <laughs> would tend to be more uh, subjects that you might want to kind of exercise, I suppose. Uh, it's a good way for me to work through, you know, feelings about various things. Um, so for me, it's definitely an exorcism. If I write about it, it makes me feel a lot better. Um, and I do hope that sort of by proxy, I suppose, if someone reads it and they have some similar feelings, you know, maybe they feel they have negative things they want to get out of their lives or, um, you know, maybe they uh, have random thoughts about cats. Uh, or <laughs> whatever like it might be. About cats. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, or, you know, <laughs> um, I hope they can read it and it helps them to exercise whatever they're feeling as well. Um, hopefully, I think that's what most poets want, isn't it? Isn't it to kind of convey some kind of meaning or some kind of message? It doesn't always have to be a profound message. It can just be this is some kind of message, just some words on a page or something that brings an image to your mind. Um, so yeah, I definitely think it can work both ways, but whether it's successful or not is another thing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, we did have a question from Sam as well in the chat box um, saying he really enjoyed our readings as well. And um, he said, you seem to each have been writing into rhythm and finding unusual ways of communicating that rhythm, numbers and dates and unexpected grammar and repetition and forward slashes. Indeed, we do have a lot of those. <laughs> How did each of you balance the page and the voice in these works? Tough one. <laughs> Anyone got any thoughts? Well, I, I have, but it does mean getting a little bit technical. Um, so I'll try, I'll, I'll, I'll be really quick. Do um, it for dummies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, 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 I'll do my best, but an apologies if it did. So it's a, a bit technical because it is a bit about grammar, but it's crucial to how I balance the page because um, what I was trying to work with is what I'm calling experimental dyxis. So dyxis is the part of grammar um, which establishes the coordinates um, of a piece of writing. And usually um, those coordinates refer to um, the subject of the text. And so usually you identify with the subject of the text and then basically here is close to the subject and there is further away. So I was trying to evacuate that subject um, and decenter that dyxis. So basically the coordinates are stripped out of the text and the reader is invited to reorient or make the coordinates themselves and that's where the rhythm and all of those sound effects that I was talking about became so important because that's a kind of poetic dykes it's a poetic way of finding yourself in the text so it's an invitation to the reader really is to take the those repetitions and those rhythms and um, construct their own um, coordinates if you like for this past that I'm trying to um, stage within the text so sorry that was a bit, a bit technical but it that was that was so basically I decentered the grammar and then I recentered it through the use of um, rhyme and rhythm and repetition I have a slightly less interesting answer <laughs> <laughs> um but possibly relevant so my my mum received her copy of rhizomes in the post when I was back at home this weekend um and she was flicking through the book and she was like where are the words <laughs> where is it um because essentially this book you know is it contains a lot of white space I mean this series of poems which I didn't read from um are entirely in the footnotes but if you were to look at Fantastic. I love it I love it <laughs> thank you if oh, you were to look at the poems that I did read from there's still quite a lot of white space we have poems situated in the margin um the pages themselves are bigger than a4 um and that's for a number of reasons the primary reason um being that I didn't want these texts to feel enclosed um and I, I like working with the fragment and kind of small utterances. Um, so yeah, that's my very untechnical answer. And then to add to, to make it even less technical, um, the book itself is, is a little bit unconventionally shaped. Um, the idea behind this being that it is kind of reflective of both 
the um the kind of sketchbook that i was using um as i was carrying out these kind of um embodied artistic rituals and also if it is held outwards it's, it's almost like a map it it, it is a really interesting book to navigate and hold and I mean you saw me struggle earlier um <laughs> so I was thinking about both the poem and making sure that there is space beyond the text itself but also the book as an object and kind of enhancing that size <laughs> of the page a little bit <laughs> No, no, that was a really good answer. I like that. <laughs> it, it is really interesting when you see it on the page because, yeah, there's a lot of white space, which was really nice. Because, um, yeah, sometimes it's very full on, isn't it? Um, and my answer to that is uh, is that normally I would use, you know, more punctuation, more space, play around with the page a lot more, actually, um, than I have in this in a sense. But that was kind of good because it meant the focus was kind of on the language and the images and um, all I used was the the forward slash basically there's not even kind of question marks or anything like that but it was quite um it was quite nice in a way it felt like they were kind of you know each poem kind of runs on with the with the slashes um so yeah for some reason it just felt right for this one um I, I, I'm a big believer in going with your gut with your writing you know sometimes it it just it, you stumble upon it and you think right this is it this, that's how it should be um and then other times it will look completely different um and I think that's the joy of writing you know in an innovative experimental way which is why I love it so much um you can be free and trust yourself and it's nice um yeah so yeah um Maybe not the most technical answer there, but you know. <laughs> you can see why I have to resort to grave robbery. I'm I get so lost in the sort of the the theoretical and experimental grammar. I need to go digging around in the ground and dig up some actual things. <laughs> 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 I I was, the answers. They were gorgeous. Um, I don't know what other questions we should choose from our ones or whether anyone else has one that they would really like to ask. Um I do think it's nice to have ones from people who are, who are watching if they prefer. Um, but we do have a couple if anyone has doesn't have any more. Oh, thank you for sharing those links, by the way. Well done, Brian. That's good. Um, I think the last one we wanted to focus on uh, is an important one, and Bryony had it. So maybe we should focus on that one, especially because I think people are getting tired. <laughs> Yeah, no, I can ask the question. Um, so I, I, I suppose this is a question for everybody, um, seeing as you're here today. Um, but I kind of also want to pose it at specifically at Nikki, Susie, and also Richard as the, the publisher of the lovely book that we're celebrating this evening. Um, the question is, what is the significance or importance of independent publishers and small presses in the UK? And, and for writers, the writers, anybody in the room who situates their work in small press, in the publications that are put out by small presses, what, why why do you do that? Why is that? Um, I'm assuming, like me, that's a conscious choice. Um, we're really excited to get our work within those independent spaces. Um, and I'm wondering, yeah, <laughs> I really, I, I phrased that better when I sent it over in an email. Sorry, everybody. It's, it's no, okay. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um I don't know uh do you do you want to go first Susie or okay yeah I'll jump in really quickly um because it's certainly something that's very close to my heart um and, and I would say there's many reasons I'm just going to choose the top three for me um and, and the first one being diversity I, I love the way that um the, the you know, these small indie presses um often have a very distinct personality um and an approach to publishing um, and you, know, you, 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 you can almost know what the, wh whose book is who just by the look and the feel of them. Um, and there's a real range. So I think you can go to different indie presses um, depending on a particular project and match it to the press where you feel that that will best sit. But diversity also in the sense that hopefully the size and the independence of these presses means that voices that weren't previously being heard are beginning to get an opportunity to come to the fore. Um, second reason, I think, is the, um, the 
the really great opportunity you have um, to form a creative partnership with a smaller press. And so that as a poet, you have a little bit of a voice in how your work is then developed and published. I mean, I think the publisher always has the final say, um, but there's a possibility for uh, some collaboration in how that then takes place, which for me has been really important. And, um, you know, I went into the second project with Guillemot um, knowing what they could do, and I designed the project accordingly. Um, it was really informed by what I knew they could bring to the text. And that for me is, is the biggest joy of publication is to have that creative partnership. And then finally, I think they're small enough that they are able to be quite personal and enter into online chats um, and really help build that sense of community. So you feel that the community of poets is a living group of people who are mutually supportive and collaborative and cheering each other on. And I think that these presses have played a huge part in creating that as an ethos of the way we work with each other. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant points. I agree with so many of those. I'm sure Brian he does too. Um, I, I think, I think the biggest thing for me as well to add to that um, being someone who enjoys less traditional, more innovative writing is that the small indie presses are the people who are willing to take these risks on um, new things and new ideas and exciting new things. Um, and, you know, all the all the best writing that I, I love is published by indie presses um and so i'm every payday i'll go and try and buy some uh, to support them because um i want them to keep going i want to i want to see what else they're going to come out with um you know if i sent my writing to certain places um it wouldn't even you know get a look in um and so i'm excited there are places where the crazy amazing creative brains of all of these amazing poets um can can find a home um you know for example with hem press as soon as richard said he was going to start a press i was just really excited uh because i knew that he would publish some amazing things um same for bryony with osmosis you know there's going to be great stuff coming out of there um and again as susie said that community is is so good and so strong um and so supportive and that is but yeah, it, I don't think it'd be the same if it was it wasn't lots of indie presses clubbing together and helping each other and, um, you know, always happy to share each other's stuff and, and shout out about people. Um, it's, it's absolutely amazing. So, yes, that's my point of indie presses. <laughs> Brian, any any comments? And Richard, we did want to put you on for a minute at the end just to tell us a bit about Hem Press as well. So. Bryony, anything to add? I'm seeing if Bryony's going to go first or, or not. Um, to be honest, I absolutely second everything both of you have <laughs> said. Um, it just brings me so much joy to kind of participate in kind of community art making um, and writing practice. And I think that independent presses are kind of at the very heart of the poetic <laughs> landscape in the UK um, and where most of the you know, important, innovative stuff is happening. And historically, it's that's been the case too. So um, speaking of stuff happening, Hem Press, Richard, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just wanted to um, just definitely echo what, what, what you guys just said um, in terms of the, the, the community building and the, the, the freedom um, small press publishing gives us as well. I think if, if I was to kind of approach it from a slightly different angle, I might say, well, one positive thing about big press publishing is that they give us access to um, plastic books in, in wide wide circulation, um, which is obviously that, that that's something that should be um, celebrated. The the downside of that is they've got payrolls to fulfil, um, and that's not a, that's not a cynical statement. That's just a, quite 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 a matter of fact thing. So inevitably, they're going to publish plastics. They're going to publish. Um, celebrity bios are going to publish you know, celebrity cookbooks and 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 things like that um so although there are many challenges facing small press publishing in terms of you know uh, unpredictability when it comes to finances and, and and things like that weirdly that actually gives us a, quite a 
good amount of freedom um, and, and, and flexibility. Um, I mean, talking as a writer, I, I feel that better than as an editor because I still need to pay for print runs. But um, but by the same token, it it gives you um, it gives you more freedom, and it, and it's nicer to be able to uh, go on little weird, you know, down little cul-de-sacs with your projects and not be stuck into a um, three book contract with 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 somebody which uh, definitely wouldn't suit my writing practice, and I I don't think it would suit. Um, the the writing practice of the readers tonight either but um but yeah just to just to talk around 10 press for uh, just a couple of points i mean firstly just thank you i'm really really grateful um that you all came and that um you supported not only nikki's book but what is effectively i think the first reading which has had just entirely hemp press authors um susie released a uh, collaboration with Chris Kerr on the Angry Starlings imprint, and we got Bryony coming in uh, June with her new pamphlet. And um, Nikki's book is is fantastic. I mean, I've, I've read a lot of Nikki, and um, I would be biased having published it, but it is definitely my favourite thing that I've, I've I've read by her. So if you haven't picked it up, then please do alongside her great books with um, Bia Bua um, Press as well. And what else was I going to say? I think that was it, to be honest. It's just to kind of signpost you to what's happening um, there and just to say, support small presses, support Gillamot, support Osmosis um, and support Street Cake. But um, unless there's anything else you, you want for me, I'll, I'll leave it at that. No, that was brilliant, Richard. And I just want to say a big thank you as well for um, for liking my book enough to put it out there. That's, that's awesome. And I, I, yeah, you've been lovely to work with as well. So... Anyone who has a, a, a send, wants to send work to Hem Press in the future, definitely do it because Richard's great. When we're open for submissions. Yeah, not now, not now. Obviously, check the website. <laughs> um, uh, I think I think really um, we should let people go now, but I just want to say a big thank you to Bryony and Susie as well for coming along and reading with me because it feels a bit lonely sometimes when you're a poet. So it's nice to have some great readers to uh, to be to be on stage with me so to speak uh, <laughs> and please do check out their books they're coming soon so just look them up um i think you're open for pre-orders susie aren't you and Bryony, are you is yours yours is open for pre-orders too isn't it yeah it's come it's starting to come the through first one probably be around may for Bryony's. yeah okay brilliant but you've got one with broken sleep that's open for pre-orders right Bryony? am i wrong yeah yeah, yeah. i'm a busy bee this <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome <laughs> That's great. I can't wait to get both of them too. Um, I'm pretty sure I pre-ordered it, but it hasn't come for me yet, so we'll have to see. But um, oh, anyway, um, anyway, amazing stuff. And thank you everyone for coming along and celebrating with me. It's really nice to celebrate uh, virtually with you all. Um, thank you. And have a lovely night. And thank you for um, supporting